Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. When Becca Ballant was elected to the U.S. House, one of her commitments was paving a way for those who came after her. And to meet that need, she started a summer internship program where people who were interested in the political process might want to work on campaigns or run for office themselves, could come learn about the experience, walk away with some tangible hands-on skills. So today, we have an old friend who has come back to talk to us about what it was like to be part of that process this last summer. So say hello again to our friend Sawyer Totten. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you for being willing to come back and, and talk about yet another aspect of your life. <laughs> but by the time we're done, you're not going to have very many secrets. So very briefly, you're not a novice to the political realm. You were an you were a legislative page when you were in the eighth grade. You were a spokesperson on behalf of transgender youth for Outright Vermont. You certainly come from a family that knows its way around a political issue. So what was there about this program that enticed you? I, so I, I'm, I'm a junior in college and as I've been thinking about what I've wanted to do post college with my major, which is international relations, I kind of at first thought I was gonna do something in the public health sphere, but whenever I was thinking about what that future looked like, everything kind of just came back to politics and government and working with governments and I've known Becca since probably like elementary, middle school. And so I've, I've known her in the past. And when I saw that she was doing this, especially with like internships really just help resumes and political internships are kind of hard to find. And like paid internships are the rarest thing in the world. So many political internships right now are unpaid. And what really drew me was finding out like how to work on a campaign all of the different aspects of a campaign from canvassing to fundraising to like managing your your candidate to meeting national politicians that kind of just drew me in because even though I've been in politics I've been in politics from the activist side and I want to start moving more of my politics focused into being on the the political side and the candidate side and working with candidates or already working them once they get into their office. Um, and that's what really drew me to the program, especially like it was a paid internship at home and I go to college out of state. And so I was able to still be at home with my family and also be in politics and, and spend my summer doing that as well. So I, I don't think I appreciated that this was actually a paid position. I was thinking this was a volunteer. It was so a, it's a you, you needed to package. submit an application for consideration then. Yes, it was, it was an application. Um, so I had to write several uh, worded responses, uh, paragraphs, responses. I don't remember what the questions were. Um, but kind of just getting a feel of like past political things that I've been involved in or current ones, experience if I had any. Um, and it went to the campaign manager, um, Natalie Silver, and and they Natalie and I don't know who else on the campaign looked through all of the um, applications. And then there were, because there was such a high demand this year, I actually had to do a, a phone interview um 
as well. And then at the end of the phone interview, um, Natalie uh, offered me the position. So it was, it was, yeah, it was a whole application process. Um, and I had to like wait a month to find out if I got in or not. And that's when I found out I had to do the phone interview. Um, and it's a $2,000 stipend and there's 10 interns in total. So that was $20,000 that they had um, set aside. Our um, payment came from the Vermont Democratic Party. Um, that's who paid us. But yeah, Natalie wanted a paid internship for Vermonters because we're such a small state and wanted to give that opportunity to high school and college students. Um, so we ranged from like junior, senior um, in high school to junior, senior in college. And one of our, uh, one of the interns was, had just graduated from UVM. So do you have a sense of what Natalie and, and the screening committee were really looking for, who it was that they thought would benefit most by participating in this internship? The, from what small, I mean, they didn't give us like the whole like rundown because I think they didn't want us to like tell our friends and like get like rig it in any way. But from the like small conversations that we had had, um, they wanted a wide range of folks. And so it wasn't all Burlington kids. I think there was only three of us who were actually from Burlington. We had one who came, was coming from Bennington. One was coming from Windsor. Um, they wanted a wide range of, of young adults from around the state, from different backgrounds who had either been really involved in politics or this was their first kind of introduction into politics. Um, all of us had different kind of backgrounds. We were all on different, like we were all in a different range of the democratic scale. Um, and so they just wanted a well-rounded group of like, some of us had experience, some of us didn't. Some of us are from Southern Vermont, some of us are from Northern or Central. Like they just wanted a bunch of different perspectives in the group and they didn't want it to just be all the same people. And it also sounds as though they were striving to find people who would be involved at at different levels within a campaign, a candidacy, or helping to run an office. Does that sound fairly accurate? Yeah. Yeah. We all, we all, I think the entire group all have future in politics and it they did their best to give us a wide range of like all of the ways that you can be involved in a campaign. Um kind of throughout the summer, I kind of realized that like campaigns are not where I like to be. I think I, I'd rather be on the side after the, like after the candidates won and working in their office on policy. I think that's where I will like strive and, and uh, be the, the best I can. Um, but it was still a, an opportunity and experience that I will never forget um, because it was just so much fun and I got to learn so much. Okay, so let's talk about exactly how the internship ran, because you're saying you learn things and, and it helped you to get clarity about exactly where you would like to land within this political process. How was this internship able to provide you with that information or with that experience? Um, so we we met for two days a week for the range of the summer we started sort of June 18th and we ran until about August the like the week of the primary in August um and the first week of the program was 9 a.m to 5 p.m ish um workshops and getting to know the campaign getting logged into things and getting our bearings and meeting each other and doing group stuff um and then kind of after that we started working on things for uh, parades, because we were coming up on the Bennington Pride Parade, which Becca was the Grand Marshal for, um, which was an amazing experience. Um, then we had all of the 4th of July parades, and then we had her scrappy little disco thrown into that whole mix as well. And so we got to uh, take part in the parades and help uh, set up the scrappy little disco. Um, and then in the actual um, work, uh, like session times, we were in her campaign office in Burlington and we were phone banking for the Scrappy Little Disco. Um, we got set up with the house coordinated campaign 
and we were phone banking for Democrats around the state um, and helping helping those. Um, and then we we zoomed with Maxwell Frost um, at one point to learn uh, just to get to know him because he's friends with Becca in Congress and he thought Becca's program was really cool um, and he has one sort of similar to it apparently. Um, and then we also learned kind of just basics of like how to create a personal story and really how to work on your personal story and hold that one because that can help get volunteers that can help your candidate um we learned oh god what else we learned it was it was like a very intensive like learning experience um we learned how to set up our own fundraiser and we had a fundraiser for becca um in the beginning of august um it was really just showing us every single aspect of a campaign from the financial stuff to what maybe like a, a volunteer coordinator would do to what social media coordinator would do. Um, we were split up into pairs and each pair was given a week uh, throughout the program that we were in charge of the social media and we, were, we had to post things and figure those out. Um, we got to meet the chair of Burlington City Council, who I'm blanking on his name now, um, but we had Mike Pichek who came into the office, who's running for state treasurer. Um, so on top of just kind of like one-on-one -on -one sort of meetings as the group with Natalie and Hannah Stein, who's the, who's Becca's, um, financial director. Um, we had guest speakers and to hear first kind of hand accounts of like their experiences and at, be able to ask them questions. Um, so it was a, like a whole hodgepodge of ways. So it, it wasn't just Natalie and Hannah just standing in the front of a room and just talking to us for eight hours a day. It was a lot of hands-on experience and we canvassed during our time, um, and a whole bunch of stuff. Now, if, if I was hearing you correctly, you spent a great deal of time actually helping with Becca's campaign, but you helped with the house combined campaign. So were those of you who were doing the internship program helping other candidates in addition to Becca? Yeah, so Becca didn't have a primary this year because no one was running against her. So it was a pretty tame election. Like it was a pretty tame primary season for her. We were doing things to help people like, like make sure people were voting for Becca, but we also, because there was not a whole lot of like counter campaigning that we had to do because no one was running against her um and she wasn't up in the primary like her, she's going to be on the like the general ballot but she wasn't on the primary ballot so we didn't have to worry about it and so to give us the experience of phone banking and canvassing uh for uh candidates we were helping um in districts that either the republican had just gave up the seat and we wanted to take it over as a democratic seat or it's a democratic seat that's going up for re-election and we want to hold it um and so to help give us that experience because they wanted us to have that experience even if we couldn't have it for becca um at some at like two different points we were phone banking for for joe biden before he dropped out um in other states so like we got connected the house coordinated campaign connected us with new hampshire and we spent an afternoon phone banking for Biden in New Hampshire. Um, and we learned how to use the the um, computer systems that create the phone banking lists. So if you ever wonder why you're getting a call from a, a candidate, it's, it's like there's so many different demographics that you can put in. And so for a lot of the people that we phone banked um, and that were on our call list, we had put in like if they were not maybe a registered Democrat or they have a little, like a really back and forth voting history and that's how they wound up on our lists and then you could if they refused if they like hung up on you you put refuse and then they would get taken off the list or if they agreed you had a bunch of questions and you could input them in as someone who wanted to uh volunteer for the campaigns or get um yard signs 
or just also find out like what key issues they wanted. And like, it was all in this computer program. So you had your laptop open and you had this whole script and you could like drop down options of like, oh yeah, they want to volunteer or they want to yard sign or no, they don't, or this is the key issue that they really care about. Um, and so, yeah, that's what we did because Becca didn't, didn't really need, did Becca, Becca didn't need that help this summer, but a bunch of other people, a bunch of candidates around the state needed it. And so we got to do that. Okay, so two questions following up. What was the most valuable thing that you learned or that was provided to you? And then if you were going to make a suggestion of this is how this internship might become more robust, what would those be? Most valuable thing. I think it was mostly just, I had one preconceived idea of how campaigns worked and I kind of just gotten shown a different, like, no, there's actually so much more that goes in and that that was super valuable to just, just see the, the work behind behind what happens because a lot of times people only see the candidate on a stage at a debate or an event and they don't see all of the people working behind and so I got to be one of those people and I and it was an experience that like I'm not gonna forget and I'm like so grateful that I got to have um one of the things that I wish could be that there's really nothing I would change about the program um, I think mainly and kind of why I'm on your show is I was the only trans person in in the group of 10 um, 10 interns I don't know about like other like sexuality wise but I know gender wise I was the only the only trans person and we had a great background of all different kinds of of youth but the one that really was not represented was queer voices. And I think that it's really important because one of the reasons why I also chose this program was Becca kind of had shown me that like, I can be a queer person in the, like in the politician side of things. I don't have to be the activist. I can actually jump to the other side and I can work for politicians or be a politician, which most likely never going to happen. I don't want to be a politician. I like the behind the scenes work, but she showed me it was possible. And so I really look like, I really look up to her and I'm so grateful that she created this program and I could work for her. But one of the things of why I have taken a step back in a lot of activist politics work in Vermont is I was always the person called upon and I've always been the voice and it, it being in the internship, it kind of just brought me back to that place of like, I'm the only one who is saying, oh yeah, don't forget to add LGBTQ rights to this list. Or like, hey, what, remember this whole thing. And it was a little bit exhausting. And I, and I, I wish they could reach out more to, to high schools, like of four queer kids and that's kind of maybe like my, my one thing of like, hey, you have a queer candidate, use it. Like that that's something I would I I hope you would use. So that may actually be something that those of us who are the long-term activists here in Vermont, that may be what we do is we go out, promote this internship, look to our queer youth and say, why are you not applying for this? So as we wrap up our time, if I'm hearing you correctly, how you personally are going to use what you learned in this internship is how it might inform you long range as a policy advisor and developer, either in a political office or in a candidate's office. Is that fairly accurate? Yeah. I think I think no one should go into politics only working on one side. Like if someone's going to go into politics and they know that they're probably going to be a campaign manager for someone someday, I think they should spend time with interning for a 
candidate who is already in office and seeing the policy side behind things and vice versa for someone who like they want to go into the policy side i think it's important to see what happens on the can on the campaign side because you don't want to lose the support of the people that you got to vote for you and you don't want to forget what they said of like what they want to see like i heard things that people wanted and like wanted or were asking me about becca which i had no clue because that was the congressional side of her office but those are things like if i ever did work for a congressperson like i'd want to be like one of my the first things like do you have any like stats of like what people were asking for you when you were campaigning like do you have a list of things people wanted because that can help and really make sure that the candidate is rooted in their constituents because their campaign and their policy like policy workers are talking to each other and like combining their strengths um so I mean, maybe I'll work on another campaign again, maybe a, like a, a a larger one at some point. But um, it was a really good experience because you can also it's the people who worked on the campaign are the reason why I would have that job. Like if I worked for a congress like congressperson or senator, like their campaign workers are the reason why I have a job because they got their candidate into office, and so you can't really have one without the other. Um, so, yeah. So a, a candidate and a candidacy and a campaign is multifaceted. And in order to be effective in any aspect of it, you need to know it from a holistic and in total sense of this is how it is interconnected. This is how when you don't address these issues, this is how the rest of the campaign suffers. And, and I remember prior to Bernie endorsing Becca, his meeting with her and wanting an assurance that she would come back home to Vermont and she would listen to her constituents. Yeah. So, so I look forward to seeing where you're going to land after you graduate and you become this highly influential policy advisor. <laughs> Maybe one day. Okay. <laughs> so, Maybe one day. so thank you for spending this time with us. And I can't yeah. wait to see what it is that you do next so I have the chance to come back and interview you again. Well, uh, funny you mentioned that. I, um, Jordan Klepper from The Daily Show uh, is uh, coming to my college uh, this Thursday. And he asked for some student moderators and the head of the political science and international relations department um, recommended for students. Um, I was one of them. And so I had to submit a list of questions. Um, and so Thursday night, I will be on stage with uh, Jordan Klepper and three, three students uh, that I know uh, from my classes. So All right. So we will circle back around and talk to you about <laughs> what that experience is like. Thank you. Good luck this year in school. Thank you. Thanks. So much fun. Hi. Welcome to All Things LGBTQ. We have a very exciting um, interview today with uh, not just an interview, but live music. <laughs> so let's get started. Um, I'd like to introduce Maya's son, Roba D. Molino. Uh, singer, songwriter, rhythm guitar, ukulele, and lead vocals. That's me. <laughs> okay. And um, she'd like you to know that as a Gen X human, uh, she's fortunate to have been surrounded by music of all genres and generations, from classical and jazz to rock and blues, from Billie Holiday to Billy Idol, and Billie, is it Eilish? Eilish. Eilish. <laughs> I didn't ask that. <laughs> There's not much she's not influenced by and enjoys. If it moves her and other humans and makes us feel connected in a life, she's for it. <laughs> Very good. Mm -hmm. My mus her, her musical journey started in high school in a garage, DYI, and you know what? Mm -hmm. This is terrible, but I had to look up what that is. Do it yourself, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Back in the day, we just kind of got together and did music stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, 
okay, what is DYI? <laughs> <laughs> and it was listed as, you know, so you could look it up and find out what it was. A DYI punk band called Field Rat. <laughs> and she started performing professionally in 2017 as a ukulele riot girl in Burlington, Vermont. That's right, yeah. <laughs> okay. I, be I believe, she says, that we are all part of a consciousness. And she plays music that speaks to our shared connections and experiences. She's always seeking to better serve consciousness and her fellow human beings through music. So welcome. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And now over here, <clears throat> we have Lorelei Rory Goodale, singer, songwriter, lead guitar, lead backup vocals. She's heard that the best introduction for a musician starts with the music they are passionate about. Since her music trees been growing for over six decades, um, she guesses that she's got to have a lot of choice uh, uh, from, she has to have a lot of choice about. Since her music tree's been growing, oh, I just said that, I'm sorry. I guess that she's got a lot to choose from. But her taproot is securely anchored in 60s folk, the crown blossoming in alternative, and a robust heart warm, a heartwood of evolving rock genres along the way, layered as concentric ring upon ring. So, um, shall we get started? Do you have sure. anything that you would like our audience to know about you? Like, do you have places you usually play, or? Yeah, we we're actually we're actually uh, quite a bit. Um, so, if if somebody goes to our website, thechamplainchargasm.com, we have a calendar on there, and it's got all the locations that we're going to be appearing. But and we could put that up too. Do you have a website? We could put it, it on the screen so people. Could, yeah, it's just www.thechamplainchargasm.com. Okay. Yep. yep. And. Um, so that's our full calendar. I mean, we've got some pretty exciting things coming up. Um, tomorrow, we're going to be down at Keene Music Festival, which I think they've been running 10 years now in wow. Keene, New, this Keene, New Hampshire. Um, and uh, they take over the entire town. And there's, I think, six or seven stages, um, all with local musicians, Vermont, New Hampshire musicians, you know, New England area. And uh, we're pretty excited. We're, we'll be on the, I forget what the name of the stage is, but we're more like the folk-oriented stage. Central Square. Central Square stage, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, so we're pretty excited about that. It's our first time uh, performing in the festival. And then um, and then September 5th, we'll be up at Despacitos in Burlington. And we're going to be performing more of a folk-oriented show. And that's going to be us, uh, Jason Baker, Abby BK, a Montreal Paul, and Waves of Adrenaline. Uh -huh. All amazing folks that you know waves. I do. <laughs> waves are amazing, yeah. yeah. So I'm pretty excited to play with them. You know, and then we're just, we're kind of all over. We're going to be in Boston in September at the Midway Cafe. You know, and it's really, it's our first year kind of doing gigs. So we're pretty excited. You know, like we, we, we've actually done pretty well. Yeah. And we've been all over. We've done, what is it? 21 farmers markets or 31 farmers markets? There'll be markets. 31 total when we get yeah. them. Though we have canceled too. So yeah, we've canceled yeah, a couple of them just because of personal things. But um, And then we've done multiple gigs up in Despositos and around the state. So Well, I have yeah. a, a brother-in-law who is a, um, he plays a lot of Cajun music mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, a lot of New Orleans Like Zedeco and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. and uh, he's in the Boston area, so nice. I'll have to tell him uh, to yeah. check yeah. out. <laughs> well, if he needs an opening band. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, do you get down to, maybe so. Um, I would like to get down to Boston more. I yeah. like Boston. Um, you know, it's a, I'm actually from New Jersey, and I, I, I was born in the Bronx. So, mm -hmm. you know, when I came to Burlington, people were like, oh, this is the big city. And I'm like, no, nah, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah. My hometown was, was bigger than Burlington, but I love Burlington, but I do like Boston. What part yeah. of Jersey? North, north, northern Jersey, um, like right by Suffern, New yeah. York, and Greenwood Lake. So I was, you know, I I'm a country to, girl. <laughs> I know. I used to go down to um, Asbury Park a lot. Well, especially in like in the last ten years, mm -hmm. the boardwalk. Everything has really changed there. Yeah, yeah, it's different. They've they've revitalized it though, especially it's beautiful. They've got things like the freak show. They brought that back yeah. and the rides and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, it was run down when I was still living there. Yeah. So yeah, 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 yeah. My parents used to drag me there when I was a kid. They were Methodist. Remember, they had all those like mm -hmm. tents that all these religious people. Yeah, in. yeah. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, okay. That had to stop early. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, and, and we didn't get there much because I, you know, I was I was in Northern New Jersey where I was in Ringwood. I mean, you had to travel an hour or so to get anywhere. The closest we had was a place called Pompton Lakes, and they had a record store and yeah. like a metaphysical shop and. and a but you could hop over to the city, right? You know? No, the no? city was far for us. City was about two hours away from really? me from Ringwood. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. We we're pretty far away, um, oh. but we went. We went all the time, you know, because yeah. especially in high school. You know, yeah. that's my cousin Leah introduced me to punk rock music, and oh, yeah. when I was in high school, that's I yeah. was in it. We were going to New York, yeah, yeah. and seeing all the good shows and, yeah. and venues that are now closed, unfortunately. But you know, much like kind of here, like I was surprised by um, the DIY punk scene uh -huh. in, in Burlington. Um, it's one of at the time I, I I rediscovered it was one of the best in the country, like huh. one of the top, and like. It seems like, like in Ringwood, we had a lot of punk bands too. And it's like wherever you're kind of isolated and, you know, like teens or, or musicians have no place to kind of like go with their frustration. Like you get these DIY pop-ups and, you know, in the 80s it was garage bands. Yeah. You know, now it's more DIY shows and things like that. It's the same thing, you know, but it's like, for me, that was like such a big deal in high school to be attached to a band at that moment. You know, yeah. somebody was sort of like an outcast and like, you know, I mean, I was didn't struggle with my trans, well, I did struggle with my transits back then. I just didn't know what it was called because this was the 70s, 80s, you know, like there were, <laughs> we didn't have words for it, you know, like, so, but it was really good for me at, like in junior, senior year, I got attached to the punk community. And it was really good for me because at that time, I mean, punks were always gender bending and yeah. there was always, always creative or colored hair or whatever. And, you know, you could pretty much do what you wanted to do, much to my parents' dismay. You know, I didn't go too far because my dad was pretty strict with that stuff, but. You know, yeah. like that's what I really love about punk, and I'm so glad. Like for me, I'm, 50, that it was I'm 52 for you. now, and yeah. like, you know, the first time we started doing punk shows was the Champlain Shorgasm, and we're standing in Despositos, and there's these young punks around me, and older punks, and then now Rory is, you know, getting into <laughs> punk rock music, which is great. You know, it's like for me, it was like coming home, and I miss that community so much, yeah. that acceptance and that like openness. It's even better now, I think. You know, so I got, what? I got swindled. See. She approached me and said, how would you like to join a folk punk band? And I heard folk, and I said, oh, that's my best <laughs> sure. I didn't know what punk was. <laughs> now you do. Now yeah. I do. Yeah. Sure do. And so are you from uh, New Jersey also? Are you from Vermont originally? Or uh, I, I, all do I have to admit it. <laughs> yeah. And that's, if, you're a, if you're a born and bred Vermonter, that's kind of a badge no, of I'm honor. Not, isn't no. it? No. I've, Born in Nershell, New York. Aha. Uh -huh. um, grew up in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, wandered out to Missouri uh, in the central U.S. to attend veterinary college. And, uh, and then came back in 79. I'm 74. Uh, came back in 79 to uh, practice veterinary medicine as a large animal dairy cow focused practice cow doc inc wow <laughs> veterinarian school is a that's a hard it's hard to get in it's hard to do it, at the time in the 70s there were only 19 schools in america u.s three in canada i believe and yes the admission rate was tougher than medical school yeah real doctor school yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no. And, um, it took a few sh shots to get in, uh, but I persevered. In the meantime, I got a master's degree, so I got enough college. For I know. So now <laughs> you're doing the fun stuff. Yeah. Really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thirty years of practice, and and you have retired and having a good time. Yeah, I retired in two thousand six. I retired when I was sixty two. I couldn't wait. I was like, all right, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So should we hear your music then? Sure. Sure. And um, so we'll take a brief pause and uh, we'll be right back with you. Awesome. So um, my name's Maya. This here is Rory. We are the Champlain Shorgasm. We are a folk punk band based out of Burlington, Vermont. Um, uh, Linda was nice enough to have us on the show. We're excited to be here. We hear we're the first live musical guest. Awesome. Um, so we're going to do uh, three songs today. This first one is... Um, Rory wrote this one. Um, this is a little bit of a political song. It has to do with um, the trans bathroom bills down in Florida, uh, which they call the um, Public Safety and Private Spaces Act. Um, you know, but um, really it's a trans bathroom bill. 
Um, yeah, so um, this song is available on the ChamplainShorgasm.com or on Spotify too. Check that out. And we've got our schedule of events. So, ready? Yep. dispute with Disney so yeah yeah so I think let's throw in Mickey Mouse and really and one of the <laughs> kind of messed that up at the beginning sorry about that but um but uh one of, one of the first that's right I forgot it's not live um but one of the first times um that song was recorded to one of our shows and they um a friend of ours posted online he tagged Ron DeSantis in the, in the post I was like that's amazing so. and the first verse is direct quote from the um Assembly member who sponsored that bill initially, <laughs> the Honorable Barnaby. The Honorable yeah, Barnaby. Yeah. He, he actually, there's footage of demons, imps, and mutants. You're not part of this world. Mm -hmm. and it's it's a yeah. It moved me. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's just it's not a good deal. And you know, for me, for me personally, like you know, it's like you know, when the politics becomes personal, like I, as a trans person, my, my, my mother lives in Florida, so I have to go to Florida to visit my mother. I love my mother. I want to see her. And like, but now it's like with this bathroom bill, it's just kind of like, it's scary. You know, they, you know, and I try and get like her to understand people to understand it's like this really directly impacts people, you know? So it's like, I got to be careful going to a bathroom. 
down in Florida because even though I pass 100% and like, you know, my gender marker here said, you know, like on my driver's license, I have to be careful anyway because they go by birth. So it's people, very People frightening. have been arrested and people have been beat yeah. up in yeah. the bathrooms yeah. themselves. Yeah. Including, and, and this is, this is people the problem. Have been killed. Yeah, and this is the problem that, that, one of the problems that we all said, okay, you're going to do this, but you might want to be aware of, is that cis women and c cis women have been harassed in women's bathrooms because they don't pass as what typically is considered female. So this is not just a problem for trans people, it's a problem for everybody. Yeah. So, you know, Florida got to do better, the rest of the country's got to do better, you know. We need to grow up. All right. So uh, this next one is a little more lighthearted. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, this lighthearted, uh, <laughs> lighthearted, yeah, lighthearted, lighthearted, quote unquote. So, um, this is our lovely little ditty about the end of days, called "As the World Comes Apart." And uh, the concept behind this one is, um, you know, we, the, the the band on the Titanic. You know, they kept as the Titanic sinking. They're like, well, not enough lifeboats, women and children first. We ain't women or children. Well, I guess we'll keep playing and entertain people as the as the boat goes down. So I thought, what if the Champlain Shargasm were that band? What if it's like. The world's coming to an end. There's fires, earthquakes, and floods, and there we are on the boardwalk in Langship Plain doing what we always do, and we're the last band to play the last song on the planet. Right. So this is what this is about. <laughs> it's fun, I promise. <laughs> For the joy I found in my life As the sunset sets out near to you Grateful for your hand And as we play our fine chords I think I finally understand It's not how long that my life will be Makes it smaller grand It's how I live that life and love the world Makes it worth a damn So as the world comes apart I hope you'll join me in a song Cause the time we have is so short And before you know it's too long That our world will come apart And there were times when I thought that I just couldn't take the pain Then I looked across the couch, you had a smile on your face You said, don't worry, I am here with you Lend a helping hand, I should have faltered on the road I'll do my best to help you stand So don't worry about the things that come Where your feet have been Because the only thing that matters Is this moment that we're in But as the world comes apart I hope you'll join me in a song Cause the time we have is so short And before you know it's too long That our world will come apart And all our dreams and our plans Be as worthless as a castle Built upon the shifting sand like just the perfect place to contemplate the end and watch the world burn. So we polished up the brass and we picked up our guitars with a smile and a shrug we headed back into the bar. Oh yes we did. Because if the whole thing should go down today we've got one final chance to play the exit music for the film and make the boardwalk dance. So as the world comes apart, we hope you'll join us in a song. Cause the time we have is so short and before you know it's too long, that our world will come apart and all our dreams and clever plans be as worthless as a castle built upon the shifting sands. Take a breath now.
takes the edge off the end of days a little bit, I think. Especially if we head back to the bar. <laughs> yeah. And, and when we're playing in a bar. Yeah. We usually put the name in the bar, say, yeah. She'll say, yeah. head back Give in. Give that personal touch. I'm <laughs> grabbing the expensive whiskey. <laughs> um, yeah, so I like, um, you know, I like um, the whole... Writing songs doesn't come easily for me. So it, it's kind of labor, but, you know, um, sometimes these magical things happen in songs. Like with that song, the whole take a breath now thing wasn't part of the song originally, but it was a very fast paced song. I wanted to write something similar to R.E.M.'s as the, the end of the world as we know it, mm -hmm. but no way I could sing that song. So I wanted something fast paced and um, got this concept. I'm like, oh, okay, let's do this. Um, so when we started singing this, both of us would run out of breath, especially Rory, because she was just starting to sing backups for me. So literally, at one point, the song would say, take a breath now. You know, let her know, like, like okay, this is where you need to take a breath in the song to get through the ooh, ooh parts, right? And we had played, then we performed it at the Venetian Soda Lounge the first time, like, I'm just going to leave it in there, because it makes sense. You know, and like, there's so much going on in the world today, like with, you know, we've got the election going on, but we've also got, you know, war in Israel and Palestine, and we've got, you know, we've got um, Ukraine going on and all kinds of stuff. Um, you and know, own, and, and, and then climate change, it's like, here. I think, you know, what we need to all remember is just to take a breath now and again, and appreciate what we've still got. Not that we don't want to fix the other stuff we do, but we need to appreciate what's here in front of us while it's still here. So, you know, that, that whole take a breath, while it was just a little thing to remind her literally to take a breath, now it's become, in context of the song in the world, a much deeper thing, you yeah. know, like, yeah. So. We introduced that song in the next one. Flowers for Lorelei at Cafe Lena uh, in Saratoga Springs. Saratoga Springs, yeah. I love that and place. And it's the longest continually operated folk venue in the country. It started in 1960. And yeah. The likes of Dylan and uh, Baez mm -hmm. and Galtrieu. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty, pretty well who to And it's there. a small little space. I mean, it's, uh, but I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful space, but... People, it takes, it has a lot of people, but they're yeah. very close together. Very, very intimate, intimate. Yeah. very intimate. And it's really cool. Like they have, um, they have a poster there. Um, that's like a, I forget what it's a, a picture of. I think it's just the Cafe Lena poster. But, you know, anybody that's performed there signs the poster their first time around. Similar to the bricks, you know, that we yeah. were talking about before. And it's like, it's just cool to see that history. And then you walk around and they got walls. You can see like in... Yeah, I, I don't think the stage is the original location, but yeah. there's pictures of, like, you know, Bob Dylan and Joe Baez and, like, like, all hanging out, just kind of playing music and, like, just being, and it was, like, so it was yeah. fun. It was, like, really cool to be there. Hope to get back. Yeah. yeah it's a great city. <laughs> okay, so the last song we've got um, for you all is um, a song called Flowers for Laurel Light, and what this has to do, um, this is... Um, actually, I wrote this for Rory, um, and uh, Rory is short for Lorelei, and... When Rory began, began her journey, and one of the things that she did was she changed her name legally. And when I did that, um, I, when I got my first piece of mail, it was like this super special moment. It was, like, it was just like, oh my God, that's me. This is, this is somebody recognizing my authentic self, finally. You know, like somebody outside that wasn't my partner or my friends. Like they all did that. Like, so for me, it was a really big deal. So when she changed her name, I wanted to make sure that she celebrated that moment. So I brought her a card with her new name on it, written out, written out fully, and some flowers and a cupcake, I think. Mm, always With a birthday candle, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and so a couple of weeks later when the flowers were dry, we made like a, you know, like a shadow box for her mm -hmm. and it's hanging on her wall and it's got the letter in it and stuff like that, the card that I sent her with the, the envelope. So, you know, flowers for Lorelai is about that moment where it doesn't matter, you don't have to be trans or gay for this to happen, but you want to become your authentic self, but people are kind of like saying, no, you can't do that, you can't be that thing, and like, but then you do it anyway, You're like, I have to, this is life or death for me, this, I must do this thing, and you get there, yeah. and then you can celebrate that moment, and that's what Flowers of Lorelei is, is all about, and all these songs are available, um, you can go on our Spotify, we have them, there's an EP we just put out a couple of months ago called, um, Live at Robot Dog Studio, it's got all these on it. Did you want to say something? Okay. I was just going to say, I just celebrated my fourth anniversary Thank as you. Renee Lorelei Goodale yeah. on Monday, August 26th. Mm -hmm. is Lorelei Day. Yeah. <laughs> Lorelei Day. 
Lorelei Day, yeah. yeah. And it's hard, and you know, it's hard, and, and to my brothers and sisters out there, I know it's hard, but keep going, because it is worth it. It's worth it. Okay? Yes, I am. Thank you for joining us, and until next time, remember, resist.